it without the microphone. Can you understand me? Because I hate this thing. Willkommen zu unserer zweiten Prosenic Lecture. Willkommen zu Bielefeld. Welcome. Nein, in Nein, Oslo should be at least enough for that. Yeah? Well, welcome to this special lecture. A Reinhard Poselic lecture at the Center of Theory at the History Department at the Bielefeld University. We are very international with this lecture. It is streamed, you see, and we are hoping for an international audience. And therefore, I will go on now in English. First, so that they understand me. And second, I think there need to be at least one person with a strong German accent so that they know we are in Eastern Westphalia and not in Santa Barbara and not in Budapest and not in Oslo. <laughs> Rainer Koselek is one of the heroes of our history department at Bielefeld and maybe the most important one. Most important in my opinion because it is not so much his case studies we remember but is his theoretical and conceptual development and establishment of conceptual history, Begriffsgeschichte. Therefore, he is not only important for a special period, but for his historical research in general. So that's the reason we have this Koselek lecture. I do stop here because there are others in this room and, uh, and Helge who will talk soon, who know much more uh, about Koselek and can much in a better informed talk about it. But still, I think, want to say, we do not, here in Bielefeld, we do not have a gallery with pictures, like for example in Heidelberg, there are staircases, there are lots of pictures, and I think there's also a Koselek. So we are not doing this, and I think that's very good, because we don't have this kind of memory. But we remember Koselek in many ways. We had this exhibition done by Britta Hochkirchen and Bettina Brandt, um, and most important, we remember and honor um, Rainer Koselek every year with, this, with a special historian with the Koselek professorship and the Koselek lecture. So I think that is much better than having a picture. And I would like to prepare to put the picture in the X building. Bielefeld historians are always very proud about, we are very proud about our theorie geleitete Forschung. Research guided by theory. Our department is talking with each other so a lot and really more than I know from other universities because we discuss our conceptual and theoretical framings and approaches. Still, since about five years, we discussed how to implement and to sharpen this profile even more. And thus, the center of theory and historical research was established in times of, as I can only now talk to the dean, saying at time, uh, times of very rare resources. Yeah? We founded the center of theory, because we want to talk more about that. The homepage, I looked into it today, it's in German and in English, has a lot of very meaningful text where you can uh, learn more what we want with this um, um, center. For example, I want to quote at least one. This shared engagement in reflecting upon our own work finds expression by the newly founded Center for Theory and Historical Research. And I think that is really important. And here we talk not only about our approaches as inspiring and sometimes annoying discussions about the use of Niklas Luhmann for early modern phenomena may be. <laughs> also about different ideas about practice, which is more inspiring than annoying. So we talk a lot about theory in history. But we also want to talk more about quite general or fundamental theory of history. And maybe most central, how can we think and talk about a theory of history if we do not believe in teleology anymore? This maybe seems a bit um, too differentiated for some of you, but I mentioned this difference between history, theory in history and theory of history because I think it's typical how long and important discussions we and the faculty had about the difference in what we want, his theory in and theory of history. In my impression and in my memory, memory about these discussions, here in this discussion evolved the most promising ideas and talks about the interaction and the dialectics between both between how to use and do theory as a historian about history. In theory, theory in, so it was a long day, it started at nine, this is a night, about theory in history and theory um, at, of history. 
And these discussions across epochs and our specific orientations, this is what is a special atmosphere in Bielefeld, in my opinion. And this is, by this, maybe a regional province here, but intellectually it does not feel provincial at all. We have in our center of theory many activities. Again, please look at the homepage, it's very nicely written there and um, very well informed. Uh, but it can be only said again and again, there is also funding for special theory-oriented workshops. Yeah? So uh, there is money in this center, not so much, yeah? where are the sources, but there is. <laughs> for really special theory-oriented workshops. We meet three times in every semester. We, meaning really the whole, all, uh, everybody in, history, in the history department, we meet three times in every semester for papers that are more specifically about theory and theoretical approaches. And this is one of these occasions. And there will be a new professorship for theory and history, the shift theory, soon. So there will be much more about theory in and theory of history um, in the coming years. And now, Coming to why we meet here today, we have not only the special workshops and this professorship, we also have the special Kozelic lecture. A bit more festive and a bit more representative than other papers. And I think that's important because it is a place and a time where we can celebrate our theory-oriented research and talk about it with each other. Today our guest is Helge Jordan, working at the ECOS that is the Institute for Cultural History in Oslo. And I'm especially thankful that I had the opportunity for these greetings because I still feel really connected, emotionally connected uh, and grateful to the ECOS because that was my first permanent position. Yeah? Then I could sleep again after this. So I still feel emotional, very grateful. Before I came to Bielefeld, where I'm now very, very happy and at uh, last but not least for the reasons I just mentioned before. Having said that, I'd like to hand over to Zoltan Sima to say more and most of all more informed about our distinguished guests. Okay, hello everyone. I think I will go talk to the microphone because I tend to be very the opposite of loud. Hello. <laughs> uh, is it okay, this volume? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I have the honor to introduce Helge Jortheim, who is going to deliver our second uh, Kostanek lecture. And Helge, I will just briefly introduce Helge. So, Helge is a professor of cultural history at the University of Oslo with a broad expertise in intellectual history, the history of concept, conceptual history, and the theory of history, especially questions, on, uh, questions of historical time. He's been holding uh, visiting professorships at uh, OSS in Paris 2014, and at New York University 2015 and 2016. Then uh, a few words about Helge's published work, which is just, you know, too many to list it here, so I will uh, mention a few of the recent ones. And uh, I would like to mention three edited volumes. The first one is with, uh, with Margaret Perna, who Helge edited uh, Civilizing Emotions, Concepts in 19th Century Asia and Europe, with Oxford University Press 2015. And uh, more recently, in 2018, with Rutledge, Helge Hall uh, Bjornstad and uh, Anne Regen Susini edited Universal History and the Making of the Global. Finally, this year, uh, Helge and Erling Svetrup Sandmo edited uh, a volume called Conceptualizing the World and Exploration Across Disciplines with Bad Handbooks. And uh, well, with the articles, they are obviously even more. And uh, I would like to mention two uh, that came out with history. Uh, uh, with history and theory, uh, <coughs> both on historical time. The first is against periodization, Kosalek's theory of multiple temporalities from 2012. The second one is multiple times in the work of synchronization from 2014, both with history and theory. And uh, more recently, we published a very interesting article together with Aina Migan, uh, also from the University of Oslo in 2018 in Millennium, the Journal of International Studies, and the article is uh, titled Conceptual Synchronization from Progress to Crisis. Finally, his latest publication is, uh, is, uh, is uh, a chapter 
and that uh, the return to chronology in the volume Rethinking Historical Time, edited by Marek Tam and Laurent Olivier, it came out just two months ago with, uh, with Bloomsbury. And uh, well, many of these, and many of others, Helge's publications, are related to the large-scale research projects that Helge has been leading over the last decade. It started with the Kultrans project, uh, Cultural Transformations in the Age of Globalization, that was running between 2009 and 2014, which was succeeded by uh, the next project called Synchronizing the World, Globalization of Multiple Times, from 2014 to 2018, and since then, there is the ongoing project called Lifetimes, a natural history of the present, and it's going until 2023. And the project investigates how uh, scales of time and scales of life come together to form temporal arrangements that impact political, social, and technological changes, past, present, and future. And today's lecture, Times of Nature, Times of History, Kosalek in the 21st Century, it even rhymes. The lecture will bring together <laughs> the, concerns, the concerns of uh, the latest project of lifetimes with Helga's uh, uh, long work on historical time and Kosalek. And it's prepared uh, specifically for this occasion, so it's, it's going to be a kind of a premiere. <laughs> so please everyone welcome Helga Yurtan. So, also vielen Dank für die Einladung. Ähm, es freut mich sehr, hier in der Welthauptstadt der Geschichtstheorie zu sein wieder. Ähm, besonderer Dank geht dann an, an Sultan Simon und Lars Weile, die das alles in die Wege geleitet haben, äh, wobei ich dann in, ins Englische wechsle. Ich werde aber versuchen, das so ein bisschen zweisprachig zu arbeiten, äh, zum, zum, zum einen in meinen, meinen Slides. Äh, und dann nachher in der Diskussion können wir auch das auch zweisprachig machen. Das ist, äh, das ist schon gut. Wo ist jetzt meine Brüche? So. Also ich werde 50 Minuten mal so reden und dann hoffentlich kommen wir nachher in der Diskussion. Ähm, so, having invested a lot of time and energy over the years in reading and writing about about Heinrich well, Kozelek, like coming to Bielefeld and give a lecture with his name on it feels uh, both inspiring and, and somewhat daunting. Um, but instead of boring you with the when I met Kozelek anecdotes or my life with Kozelek anecdotes, I'll just jump right into my, my, my lecture. There's only one thing I, I, I like to add, and this maybe is a kind of disclaimer before I start, that this will not be a lecture of because I like philology, or even because I like exegesis, even though I will make a couple of hardcore philological arguments, I think. Uh, but for me, I like to say this before I start, because I like work is a, is a quarry, kind of, into which I go to work, to, to struggle, in order to, to break loose some pieces that I can use in my work as a cultural and intellectual historian. And if the materials, or in this case, uh, the sentences, the concepts, the metaphors, the arguments, Resist Kozelek's arguments, that is, that is not necessarily a bad thing. So the point is not always to understand Kozelek's thoughts going forward here. Now, the question that I'm going to pose to Kozelek's work, that I'm going to take into the quarry this time, is not a question he himself could have asked, at least not in this form. It's a question that belongs, is historically located in the second decade of the 21st century. In 2017, 1,564 scientists from 184 countries issued a warning, indeed a second warning, it's already the first one, published in the journal Bioscience, that mankind has unleashed a sixth mass extinction event, where many current life forms could be annihilated by the end of the century. This is, uh, in the last 540, oh, that was my first time, in the last 540 million years, there have been five other such events. The fifth took place 66 million years ago and was caused by the impact of an asteroid. The third and biggest volcanic eruption happened 251 million years ago and killed 96% of life on Earth. The sixth mass extinction event is happening now and is caused by human overpopulation and overconsumption. 
At the same time, populations across the globe are currently outliving the cultural and social structures put in place to care for much younger population. In Europe, the proportion of people older than 65 is appro approaching 25%, and in Japan, the average life expectancy of women is now 86 and a half years. That's the highest in the world. Now, the question then is, in what time do these events events like these, the sixth mass extinction event, population aging, those of climate change, rising sea levels, genetic engineering, take place. If they take place in history, what is this history? What is this historical time which can encompass all these chronologies and different forms of life? If they take place in nature, what is this nature? What is this natural time that's able to include all of this? As you're probably aware of, the contemporary historian who is most effectively asked similar questions is Deepa Chakrabarty in his two essays, The Climate of History from 2008 and Anthropocene Time from 2018. Whereas the first is the most quoted, the second may be the most interesting. Why, Chakrabarty asked, is it so hard for historians to think and write about the Anthropocene? Or in general, as he puts it, about questions of geological time. These questions, he goes on, keep falling out of view, and the time of human world history comes to predominate, with the effect that we do not take into account Earth history processes that outscale our very human sense of time, and do not quite see the depth of the predicament that confronts humans today." End of quote. Chakrabarty goes on to offer several examples of how ongoing debates about climate change and geological periodization fail to reconnect, as he says, human-centered and planet-centered time. That's a paraphrase from the Earth System scientist Jan Solzevich. But in spite of this universalistic planetary scope, Chakrabarty's question is still too limited, I think, since it remains fully encompassed in this particular version of geological periodization, the Anthropocene. In other words, the questions he's asking only engages with one alternative time scale to human history, the geological reaching some four and a half billion years back in time, if we consider the age of the Earth, some 13 billion years, if we consider the universe. But there are other events that cannot be grasped by historical time either. Every day, about a dozen species go extinct at thousand times the background extinction rate due to human act activities. What kind of event is this? And how can it be inscribed into history? So these are the questions I take with me when I today enter into the quarry of Kozelek's works. Uh, in your company. But I think before we enter, it's important to clarify that the question is not really why. Why is it so hard for historians to engage with geological, biological, or indeed cosmological times? I think we know the answer to that. It's because history, not at least the modern regime of historicity, to use a term by someone who's also had the honor of giving this lecture, François Hartog, is fitted exactly to the human scale. To illustrate visually, as it were, what history fitted to the human scale might mean, I suggest we think of history like the Vitruvian man of time. As you know, Leonardo da Vinci's drawing the Vitruvian man demonstrates how the proportions of the human body fit exactly into the two most fundamental and perfect shapes of geometrical space, the circle and the rectangle, described in Vitruvius's The Architectura. What if we thought about our temporal environment in the same way? Whereas architecture, the Trudeau's topic, represents a way of shaping space according to human needs, history might be seen as a way of shaping time in the same way. To understand what history is about to become around the same time as Da Vinci was making his drawings, we could imagine another Vitruvian man, projected into not geometrical space, but into chronological time. Of course, this man wouldn't be Vitruvian at all, he would be Viconian or Leibnizian, but this is for now less important. According to this analogy, the proportions of history are human proportions, durations, intervals, rhythms, and speeds. And one of the most radical versions of this anthropocentric time can be found, I would argue, in Koselik's work. It even has a visual representation, a man-like figure connected to it. Not the Vitruvian man, but the Roman god Janus, with his two faces. 
If anything like Vitruvian man of history exists, it must be disfigured, the face of Janus. In his 1972 introduction to Geschichte der Grundbegriffe, Kosalek deploys this exact image to describe Zeit. In this period, he writes, concepts carry a Janus Gesicht, a Janus face. And he goes on, Facing backwards, they signify social and political realities no longer intelligible to us without critical commentary. Facing forward to our own time, they've gained meanings that can be explained, but that we can also understand without explanation. Only a couple of years later, in one of his most famous essays, these two directions, the backwards and the forwards, will gain new names. In the conceptual pair, that's the first coinage by Gosalek to catch the attention of historians outside of Germany. The backwards becomes Erfahrungsraum, space of uh, experience. The forwards, Erwartungshorizont, horizon of understanding, of, uh, of expectation. And thus, by means of this phenomenological shift, time itself becomes absolutely absorbed in the anthropological, in the world of the human. Whereas past and future could still contain elements that lie outside of the proportions, to use Da Vinci's word, the temporal proportions, only the scope of the human. Experience and expectation cannot, at least not in an immediately graspable way. All past is predicated on experience, the backwards case. All future on expectation, the forwards case. Or, as Guzalek puts it in the same essay, there's no history that could be constituted independently of the experiences and expectations of active human agents. And he continues, accordingly, these two categories are indicative of a general human condition. One could say that they indicate an anthropological condition without which history is neither possible nor conceivable. The conditions of possibility of real history are, at the same time, conditions of cognition. Experience and expectation are two categories appropriate for the treatment of historical time because of the way that they involve the past and future. Clearly, there are a lot of problems with the analogy between the Vitruvian man, the Roman Gaudianus, and the concept of history. Not least, it offers another example of how representations of time is absolutely predicated on spatial imagery, a returning topic in Kozalek's writings. Also, the anthropocentric foundations of history have been exposed uh, in much more sophisticated ways than this. For example, by Eva Domanska in her work on posthumanism, and Daniel Lord Smale in his writings on deep history, only to mention two examples. What the Janus phase reminds us of, however, is that with his theory of space of experience and horizon of expectation, Kozalek has offered one of the probably most explicitly anthropocentric theories of history still in use. By which, we also know this from St. Augustine, of course, the entirety of time is enclosed in the human mind. This observation might prompt us to ask another question. If we're really bent on finding an answer to Chakrabarty's predicament, which is also a predicament of many other contemporary historians, I could only mention David Armitage, Armitage and Joe Goldie in their work in the History Manifesto, why historians are, are at the loss of dealing with the times of nature, why on earth should we turn to Coselli? The originator of one of the most anthropocentric of all anthropocentric theories of history. So this is what I'm going to spend the rest of this lecture explaining, I think. Sound okay? Speed okay? Good. So the short answer, I think, to this question is that in his entire career as a historian, Kozelek remains intensely interested, preoccupied, I would even say obsessed by nature. We're in more academic terms. Fernand Baudet aside, I know no other social, political, or intellectual historian from the post-war era who's had a similar systematic interest in nature, natural times, and indeed natural history, than Kozelek. I know this is a big claim, and there's many of you who will protest, and you probably should, but anyway. And that includes other white males of the period, Michel Foucault, Quentin Skinner, J.T. L. Pocock, as well as Kozelek's colleagues in Bielefeld, Jürgen Koppel, hans Ulrich Wieler, and in France, François Attaou. Even if you move beyond white male historians to cultural and historical theorists like Alain Asman or to the already mentioned Deepa Shopper Party, whose interest in nature coincides with climate change, I think the argument stands. One obvious exception would be Hans Blumberg, but that's a topic for another lecture. But you're welcome to prove me wrong. Now, in addition to rereading re Kozelek as the harbinger of a new form of natural history, this is what I'm going to do. 
I will also make a second related claim that in the span of his work, Kozelek changes his view on nature. Finally, before I move from telling to showing, I can add that in preparing for this talk, I was surprised at exactly how pervasive this, this, uh, his engagement with nature really is and how deep it goes. But I will start with something that isn't deep at all, it's superficial and indeed in your face. As you will all recognize, these are the covers of the two volumes of collected essays that were published during the last years of Kozelek's life. The second one came out just after he passed away. Since this is not a lecture on intellectual biography or Kozelek philology, I will be less interested in how involved Kozelek was in designing the covers for these two back books. I'm sure there are other people in the room who knows more about this than I do, uh, and I would love to hear about it. Uh, what we do now, however, is that Kozelek in general took great interest in visuality, in visual representations, not least in the later part of his life, exemplified by his unfinished project about war memorials, as well as his ideas for a political iconology. And before that, in his drawings, expertly documented by Bettina Brandt and Britta Hochkirchen in the exhibition Kozelek und das Bild, took place in this very city a little more than a year ago, and where I'll get the, uh, a little, uh, well, a little tour tomorrow of what's left of it. I'm grateful for that. Anyway, both book covers carries photos documenting the deep time of nature, in terms of rock layers on the left and glaciers on the right. The picture of the layered rock face, which could have been teaching material for a class in stratigraphy, picks up an important theme in the collection as a whole, the idea of temporal layering, Zeitschichten, as you know, or as it's now called in a recent English translation, the sediments of time. As far as I know, Kozelet makes no similar use of glaciers as a structure of meta metaphor for his thinking. Hence, in this case, it's up to the readers, us, to make the connection between the title, Begriffsgeschichten, conceptual histories in plural, and the glaciers on the cover. But I'll leave that to you for now, and I, I don't think it's too hard, actually. I just want to make one more observation about the covers at this point. The cover photographs was taken by Bernhard Edmeyer, Germany's probably most famous natural photographer. He was educated as a geologist and became famous for making aerial photos of the surface of the Earth. A French geological magazine has described his photos as the print of time on the skin of the Earth. So here's the uh, original photo that for some reason was mirror inverted for the cover. In my most famous book, Earth Song, was published in 2004 and documents the Earth and its morphology from the point of view based on pattern recognition. These patterns overlap somewhat with what Kozele calls the Holostruktur, structures of repetition, which I will return to later in the talk. So I'll leave these covers for now, just to encourage you to think about for a comparison. Uh, covers of other history books that you know about, featuring events like the French Revolution, Prussian state building, the Second World War, and historical figures like Frédéric de Grey, de Grey, de Grey, <laughs> Grosse, Hada, and Goethe. Which is just another way of saying that I don't think there's anything coincidental about the selection of cover photos for the two volumes of Kozelek's essays. Whether it was he who selected them or not, the motives from nature, the rock face and the glaciers were selected because these books are about nature but in what ways. So, there are different approaches that we could take to understand the role of nature in Kozelek's work, depending at least on how we define it. And this is probably where I need to be somewhat more precise about the line of my argument. By nature, I do not mean the existential anthropological constant Grundbestimmungen, which Kozelek adopted mainly from Heidegger's analytics of Dasein and adjusted to the conflict uh, orientation he'd inherited from Karl Schmitt. These Grundbestimmungen appear throughout Kozelek's work in, in a different version, but almost always, as you know, they include dichotomies from der Später um unten in Außen, that is sooner or later, above and below, inside and outside. Together they make up what Kozelek refers to as conditions <coughs> for possible history which again form the core of what in reference to Joyce in terms of his tool work. These oppositions have received a lot of attention in Kozelek scholarship, maybe too much attention, especially since they might in the end be little more than Kozelek's attempt to wriggle himself loose from what they perceived to be the looming presence of Gallimarian hermeneutics and the 1980s version of the so-called linguistic term. Anyway, even if you would accept that 
this idea, this idea of something free linguistic and pre evenementiel to use Baudel terms, prior to historical event, it would not be a much help for the argument that I'm making here. What these dichotomies amount to, in the end, is an anthropology. An analytics of human finitude, of Dasein. And hence they contribute, the, the, they contribute to keeping time enclosed within the framework of the human. In an interesting essay from 2006, Angelika Epple argues that Kozelek's attempt at making natural time the basis of his historic is deemed to fail, since natural time as such is not accessible to human experience. And in the moment uh, natural time becomes mani manifest in calendars and clocks, it isn't natural anymore. It's human, it's cultural. As a critique of Kozelek's anthropology, I think she's right. But in the broader picture of natural historical times and their role in Kozelek's works, I think there might be more at stake as well. What we agree on, however, is that nature is something else than an abstract analytics of finitude. Nature is also physis, the real physical material nature, which in Greek philosophy stood in opposition to nomos, human law and custom in the sophist tradition, and to metaphysics in the Aristotelian tradition. This is the nature I will be addressing in this talk, and I think Kozelek is addressing when he attempts to develop the framework for a new natural history. So the rest of the lecture will be dedicated to understanding how Kozalek thinks about nature as fuses, and especially about natural times in relation to, and indeed, an entanglement with historical times. To simplify the discussion somewhat, I will borrow a term that Kozalek himself uses quite often, and focus on what he calls denaturalization, denaturalisierung of history. And I will discuss it uh, in opposition to what I would like to call uh, renaturalization. Indeed, a renaturalization of both history and historiography is taking place as we speak, as I hinted at at the beginning of the talk. What I will argue then is that this, this renaturalization is anticipated as a historiographical possibility in Kozelek's work. It's less explicit than the denaturalization, but no less striking when you start looking for it. At this point, and, and going back to, to Antje's remark about a theory in history and of history at the beginning, I should probably issue the same warning that indeed many of us who talk about Kozelek have to issue every now and again in order to not to be misunderstood. In Kozelek's works, the boundaries between historiography and theory are continuously blurred right, in the history of history, including in the case of the already mentioned historic. His argument constantly oscillates between studies of the emergence of the modern paradigm of history and theoretical interventions into the same. So I'll try to follow these oscillation and introduce what I see as the necessary distinctions, but in some cases also, it's also necessary to adopt some of Kozelek's own slippages. When this happens, I can just ask you to bear with me. And first I'll, I'll turn to the process of denaturalization taking place in Kozelek's works, mostly from the 1970s. I need some water. Okay. So my discussion sets off with uh, Vergangene Zukunft, Futures Past, first published in 1979, and assembling essays from the preceding decade, often composed in response to his work with Geschichte der Grundbegriffe. And this collection, denaturalization, operates both in the history of historiography and on a theoretical level, I would say. It is here I argue that nature emerges as a blind spot in Kozalek's works. How this somewhat paradoxical claim emerge as a blind spot can make sense, I'll demonstrate by means of a close reading in a second. In the preface to Vergangene Zukunft, Kozalek describes how historical time splits up in different social and political actions, or units of action, Handlungseinheiten, as he calls it, drawing chronological terminology tied to concrete, acting and suffering people, as well as their institutions and organizations." End of quote. All these units of action, he argues, in the tradition from Leibniz and Herder, have their own inherent processes of completion, Vollzugsweisen, with a specific temporal rhythm. As examples, he lists public holidays and festivals, working hours, etc. Therefore, he famously concludes, the following will attempt to speak not of one historical time, but of several superimposed one upon the other. And as a support for this claim, he quotes Hadda. 
in her as emphatic, oh, English, in emphatic words that her aim with Kant. In reality, every mutable thing has its own inherent measure of time. This will persist even if not, no other were there. Never do two things in the world have the same measure of time. In other words, there are, one can say it earnestly and courageously in the universe at any, any one time in innumerable different times. Many of you will recognize this quote from Hedda's Metacritic of Kant's New Critical Philosophy, published in 1799, in which the theologian and philosopher critic attacks Kant's idea of time and indeed space as forms of Anschauung, human intuition, projected onto the world. On the contrary, Hedda argues, Time is not an intuition. Neither is the thing in itself, as Newton had recently argued. Time is inherent in things and processes. These have their own durations, their own speeds, their own rhythms. That Kozalek's degrees in his claim falls from the arguments he's just made about units of action, institutional organizations, and their inherent rhythms. But the striking thing at this point is not what he includes, but what he omit, omits from Herder's original text what these three points, dot, 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 are really hiding. My pulse, my step, or the flight of my thoughts is not a temporal measure for others. The flow of a river, the growth of a tree cannot measure time for all rivers, trees, and plants. Lifetimes of elephants and the most ephemeral are very different from each other. And how different are not the temporal measures on all planets? So when Kozadek quotes Hannah, in support of his idea of a shift from historical time in singular to historical times in plural, he explicitly, in his own text, brackets and omits nature. And not just any part of nature, this is nature in its entirety, right? From the small to the large, from the slow to the fast, from the most durable to the transitory. Covering more, more or less the entire life scale, the entire scala naturans, from the mineral kingdom of the rivers, the plant kingdom of the trees, the animal kingdom of the elephants, and the human. All conceived in terms of relative differences on a scale. Or rather on two scales. The life scale, scala naturans, and the time scale, from short to long, from fast to slow. When they combine these time scales and life scales form what I, with a quote from the same uh, Herder passage, we'll call lifetimes. I will come back to this quote at the end of the lecture. At this point, to cut up Hada, quote seems mostly to illustrate, in a rather simplified, sort of philological way, how historical time is brought into existence by means of bracketing nature in all its manifestations, thus denaturalizing history. To Kozelek, however, this denaturalization is not only, not even primarily, a theoretical gesture, but a historical process described and analyzed in many of his writings. Now, go through some of it. In his essay on the need for theory of history, in history, Über die Theorie Bedürftigkeit der Geschichtswissenschaft, published in 1972, Kozalek traces how a denaturalization of historical time and what he calls the destruction of natural chronology took place at the end of the 18th century. Prior to this, he argues, the process of history had been organized according to natural categories, the rise and setting of the sun and the moon, the change of seasons, as well as the birth and death of members of the ruling dynasties. But from the late 18th century onward, historiography was reconfigured according to categories ob obtained from history itself, derived directly from historical events, experiences, and expectations, such as progress, decline, acceleration, or delay, the not yet and not anymore, the before and the after, the too early and the too late, the situation and the duration, according to a list from an article published in the same year. Different versions of this process of denaturalization can be found all over Kozadek's work, distributed mainly around three topics, I think. One is historiographical, dealing with how the genre of historia naturalis dissolves and is supplanted by other, less comprehensive forms of history writing, at the same time as nature itself is temporalized and develops a histories, or indeed multiple histories, of its own, the history of the Earth, the history of the universe, the history of different species. Another topic is predominantly conceptual, focusing on how concepts like Geschichte, Fortschritte, Neuzeit, history, progress, and modernity come to replace cosmological, seasonal, and generational chronologies as organizing tropes for historical time. And finally, there's a term that we might refer to as ontological. 
which asks what happens to time itself in the moment when history breaks free of the static and stable confines of nature to become a freewheeling, self-sustaining movement capable of producing, speeding up, or occasionally slowing down events by virtue of nothing but its own very existence. In the following, I'll try to revisit all of these three topics uh, in turn, the historiographical, the conceptual, and the ontological. I don't know if that's the right term, there's a term I'm testing out. An interesting version, and an important version, I think, of the historiographical argument can be found in the entry on Geschichte, history, in Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe, in the section where Kozelek analyzes the shift from Historia Naturalis to natural history, Naturgeschichte, in the second half of the 18th century. As long as Historia, in the Aristotelian tradition, meant little more than empirical knowledge, or knowledge about particulars gained through induction, with no particular ambition of arriving at the general principle or law, neither the temporal distinction, past-present, nor the natural distinction, human-non-human, -human, was especially significant. In the entry, Kozelek shows how nature is temporalized, is invested with a time and history of its own, linked to genesis, transformation, and persistence. In this way, the natural history arises. This shift then opens the, way for, opens the way for theories of evolution, which will come to dominate the 19th century. What Kozelek does not discuss at any length, however, is how it's exactly the parallel, synchronous temporalization of natural history on the one hand, and human history on the other, that forces the two of them to part ways. In Kozelek's discussion of how, how history frees itself from nature and becomes a force of its own, Nature, by contrast, emerges static and stable. In other words, the reason why history with the big age, history as collective singular, is shaking off all the other forms of life belonging to the Aristotelian historia and becoming a history of humans and humans only is that it starts moving from the past through the present into, the, into an unknown future, increasingly picking up speed, increasingly accelerating. And this movement is necessarily linked to human hopes, memories, and actions, or if you like, to expectations, experiences, and expectations. So, what Godelek does not pay much attention to then, at least not until much later in his work, and I'm going to come to that later in the talk, is that the temporalization of nature is part of the very same process. Or rather, what he does not do, at least not initially, is to bring the argument that he develops in the entry in, in Geschichte der Grundbegriffe about the temporalization of the Historia Naturalis and, and the rise of Naturgeschichte into the more general discussions about the emergence of history in the modern sense. As studied in large detail by historians of science like Martin Rudwig and Roller Rappaport, natural history also goes through a process of temporalizations at the end of the 18th century. But whereas the temporalization of nature found its primary disciplinary form in geology, which organized itself around a deep and multi-layered time, the temporalization of the human opted for the singular, homogeneous, more or less Newtonian time of progress, in connection with dreams of an origin of mankind some 6,000 years ago. Whereas geology opened up to a field of different forces in the evolution of the Earth, Neptune is giving priority to water, Pluton is to fire, history took refuge in nations, cultures, and individuals. At this point in his work, in the 70s, Kozelek appears to ignore the fact that his disciplines of choice, history and politics, exist within a larger order of knowledge, which also took shape during the Zatan side, and which includes other distinctly, distinctly historical knowledge projects, such as geology, biology, cosmology. And these are the knowledge projects which we now need to recombine in order to write the histories of the Anthropocene. Moving from the historiographical to the conceptual, we realize that in Kozelek's studies of the concepts of progress history, Neuzeit, Bildung, Revolution, this process of denaturalization repeats itself again and again and again. Natural times give way to other genuinely historical times for which these and other concepts are both indicators and factors. As such, they are linguistic and semantic symptoms for changing experiences of time, but they are also themselves part of this change in the way they reconceptualize, thus restructure time. For instance, the concept of progress gives historical time a kind of linearity and homogeneity it didn't have before, and also, in some cases, a sense of direction. 
Finally, to the ontological. Probably the most systematic discussion about historical times and natural times become disentangled in modernity can be found in the essay Does History Accelerate? Gibt es eine Beschleunigung der Geschichte, first published in 1976, more or less at the same time that the other essays discussed here. My hypothesis, Gosalek writes, is that acceleration corresponds to a denaturalization, denaturalization of the traditional experience of time. In this essay, like in many others, Gosalek starts from the assumption that the human experience of time is largely dependent on nature, either cosmological nature, nature in terms of the movement of the stars and the planets, or biological nature in terms of the human lifespan from birth to death, as well as the succession of generations in ruling dynasties, as well as more ordinary men and women. But in the Zadl side, factors are introduced into the human experience of time and history, which gives it, in Gazelek's words, a relatively large degree of independence from nature. And he adds, if progress is the first genuinely historical category of time, acceleration is a specific version of this progress. Due to technology-driven acceleration processes in politics as well as in communication, Temporal rhythms and temporal progression emerge that cannot be derived from any time of nature or any succession of generations. End of quote. Everything changed at a faster pace that one, than one would imagine and has become used to. Events and experiences stack up in ever shorter temporal intervals. Natural time, on the one hand, remains the same. On the other hand, remains the same. It gives human life the same stable rhythm. Natural chronologies Cosmological or biological are based on repetitive movements, the revolution of the planets, the changing season, the eternal circle of life and death, generational succession. Historical time liberates itself from natural time in two ways. Ontologically, in the sense that natural time belongs to what Gazalek refers to as conditions for possible histories, which affect historical changes, but which themselves remain unchanged. And historically, in the sense that natural time is associated with traditional pre-modern societies, which from the subtle side onward are superseded by the technological and civilization development of Western modernity. So in this sense, arguments about natural time is part of what Johannes Fabian calls the denial of coevalence, by which primitive societies are placed in a different time than the societies of those who study them. A time that's indeed stable, immutable, nature-oriented, as opposed to the denaturalized, accelerating time of Western, of Western civilization and progress. Thus, the questions of nature and natural time also play a central role in Gosalek's theory, theory of non-synchronicity und Gleitzeitigkeit and the Gleitzeitigkeit des Gleitzeitigen, which have led Achim Landwehr and others to label him a Eurocentrist. Which, content-wise, is absolutely and trivially true, but misses the mark, I think. Now, to summarize the first part of the argument, the denaturalization, argue, denaturalization part, in Gosnellic's writings, especially from the 1970s, history in the modern sense is based on denaturalization of time. Historical time, both in singular and plural, come into being when concepts of progress, future civilization, and others replace planetary rhythm, seasonal changes, and generational succession as the main organizing principles for social and collective times. Times become enclosed in the Yana's figure of experience and expectation. However, to stick with Yana's for a moment, this is only half the picture half the face that Kozelek's work presents to us with respect to historical and natural times. Now I'll turn to the other half, which I tentatively have called uh, or labeled renaturalization, and which seems to become more dominant in Kozelek's works from the mid-80s, 1980s onwards. In response to the challenges to the discipline of history I presented to you at the beginning, I understand renaturalization as an attempt to reintegrate, re-entangle, if you like, the times of nature and the times of history. If we need a label for this project, we could think of it as a natural history for the 21st century. Attempts at writing these kinds of natural histories are taking place as we speak 
in terms of large comprehensive narratives adhering to labels like deep history, big history. These narratives have found a home in popular science, which in the last decades have been dominated by bestsellers like Yul Harari's Sapiens and Homo Deus. But maybe this return of brand narratives isn't the best place to start. Personally, I'm not completely convinced that the best way to re-entangle natural and historical times in the writing of history is through the grandest of grand narratives. Or in the words of Daniel Woods Mayo, to create, I quote, a seamless narrative that acknowledges the full chronology of the human past. Which for him means bundling together the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. What I find in Kozelek is something else entirely. Uh, not so much acknowledging the fullness of the human past, but the fullness of time, or more precisely the fullness of the plurality of times, both historical and natural, both the human and non-human. For a renewed engagement of historiography with the natural, nature cannot be reduced to a stable, all but immutable backdrop to historical events, or in Kozelek's terms, a mere condition for possible histories, which aren't in themselves historical, which do not in themselves have a history. On the contrary, for nature to be reintegrated into historiography, it must bring along with it its full temporal richness. Across the whole range of timescales involved, from the billions of years since the Earth formed, to the firing rates of neurons in the human brain, which is stipulated to be around 0.29 and 1.82 per second. The same goes for all the life scales, from the smallest to the largest, from the least complex to the most complex. In this continuity of what I call lifetimes, continuum of what I call lifetimes, certain forms of life, combined with certain forms of times, rhythms, durations and speed, as well as with technologies and concepts, to form more or less stable temporal formats and structures. To start responding to some of the questions I asked at the beginning, history, based on the collective social and political time, needs to reconnect with other lifetimes distributed across this continuum. And uh, I think illuminating description of this continuum of natural and historical times can be found in a small, mostly overlooked text that Gazelle published in 2003 in a small Reklam heft edited by Stefan Jordan entitled Lexikon Geschichtswissenschaft 100 Grundbegriffe. In this small volume directed at students of history, Kozelek has written the entry on time. Unsurprisingly, I guess. Most of the five-page piece is rather traditional, mapping out the distinction between inner experienced phenomenological time on the one hand, outer cosmological, geophysical, and biological time on the other hand. But he also warns that this distinction cannot really be upheld since natural times are, are registered, represented, and deployed in different ways in different cultures, and thus gain social and cultural dimension. So far, so good. In time research, this must be said to be rather familiar terrain. Then, in the second dichotomy, somewhat less predictable, but not very radical either, he distinguishes between directional and repetitive time. And as we shall see, it is indeed the question of repetition and repeatability, which became increasingly important to Kozelek in the last years of his life, that opens his, works, his work up to another kind of engagement with natural times. Or rather, it's a dialectics of repetition and renewal, whereas Kozelek's earlier text on progress, modernity, and future emphasized more the renewal part of this equation. In his later years, he became more and more fascinated, it seems, by the element of repetition and repeatability. And thus, with another set of temporal rhythms, in which natural times play a much bigger part. In this sense, the following passage from the entry to Lexikon Geschichtswissenschaft can be read almost as a new research program. In nature and history, the times pluralize themselves. They are attributed to cosmic or social and political systems, which each lay claim on their own time. Different systems bring forth different times at the same time, the synchronous still and non-synchronous. These temporal determinations are dependent on the position of the observer, both in the natural and historical sciences. They cannot be brought down to a common denominator without contradiction.
in this passage, I will argue, because that like, offers the first draft of an alternative theory of historical times, different from the one we find in most of his earlier texts, which open up to, opens up to re-entanglement re of natural and historical times as a fr framework for writing history. Even one of the most problematic tropes of his entire work, the Gleitzeit, this guy's and Gleitzeit, seems to gain a new meaning. Envisioning here a plur plur plurality of times that cannot be broken down to differences of cultural language and class, but instead brings in, brings in questions like, how can the long-term geological time of the Anthropocene be combined with the ever-accelerating ever times of local and global politics? But this shift in Kazakh's thinking, involving both the re-temporalization of nature and the re-naturalization of history, does not begin, of course, in this rather short and didactic text from 2003. Rather, this is where it finds the most condensed and maybe the most effective form. And I'm sure many of you will be able to trace these ideas of a temporalized nature converging with temporalized history to different texts in different parts of Kazakh's work. So I'll just offer one trajectory that I find uh, illuminating. And at first it seems somewhat paradoxical, since it takes us back to a text that doesn't deal with time at all. At least not over overtly, but with space. In 1986, Godelek gave the concluding lecture at the Historica Tag in Tria. However, the lecture wasn't published until 2000 in the volume Zeitschichten, and then with the title Raum und Geschichte, Space and History. The essay is interesting for several reasons that Gazelek's hitherto most systematic engagement with nature takes place in an essay dedicated to space, not time, should not come as a complete surprise. On the contrary, it confirms Gazelek's place in the tradition from the French Annal school, culminating in the works of Fernand Baudet, but also in the more contentious tradition of German Strukturgeschichte, spearheaded by Gazelek's teachers and co-editors of the GG, Otto Brunner and Werner Konze, and strongly supported by the National Socialists. Drawing on, but also clearly distancing himself from his German predecessors, Kozelek starts by considering natural space. Natural spatial pre-givens, Vorgaben, as he calls them, in terms of conditions for possible histories, and as a backdrop or stage for history. From this starting point, he offers a sharp criticism of the naive spatial determinism inherited in the project of geopolitik, which also cannot be disentangled from the political uses it was put to during the Nazi period. But it's the other half of the essay I will be interested in here. At the beginning, Kozanek returns to the point where he concluded his discussion of the shift from Historia Naturalis to Naturgeschichte in the entry in the GG. But the critical edge has shifted. Again, he observes how nature is temporalized, but then he adds, a questionable opposition thus emerges between nature and history. One that still occupied, occupies us today, perhaps no, now more than ever, in light of the various ecological challenges we face. This is 1996. Thirty years later, in the article on Anthropocene Time, Trigger is mainly just repeating the same argument. In Kazalek's 1996 lecture, the reference to ecological challenges was more than politically correct lip service to the German historical community. Rather, this is a concern that runs through the entire essay in different permutations. After having explained how nature and climate serve as conditions for possible history that, as he puts it, escapes human control but not human use, he adds the following slightly intriguing passage. It's a long one. It's so much shorter in English, I find that interesting. <laughs> That's the really English one. In our century, like it or not, the climate has entered the realm of possible human control. Just for millennia, the world of plants and increasingly animals became subject to human control. Our globe might soon be transformed into a single zoo, though one might well ask how, who holds whom captive, the animals or the humans. Limits on the control and use of resources have shifted enormously over the course of human history, and it would be an exciting story to account for this process as a contribution to the ecology of the present, as a common undertaking from the perspectives of both natural science and of political and social history. So, except for a few singular authors with background in natural sciences who venture into history uh, writing as a popular science, this common undertaking still have, has not been realized. At present, however, new institutional frameworks finally begin to appear in which something like this might be possible. 
But before this can happen, a set of theoretical, methodological, and empirical questions need to be confronted head on. And this is sort of what Kozalik does in an anticipatory way. Theoretically, he writes, this would entail asking where the meta-historical pre-givens of the space of human life are shifted and transformed into historical pre-givens that humans can influence, master, and exploit. Kozalik's own contribution to this theorization falls in the second part of the essay, where he, in his own words, attempts to correlate, correlate our question about spatial, meta-historical, and historical conditions temporally. What follows is a three-phase version of that long-term historical transformation that the geographer David Harvey, three years later, in his 1989 book, The Condition of Postmodernity, will call space-time compression. In this version, however, because Alex's version, the theory of the shrinking world is expanded by Kozelek's own theory of acceleration, according to which the transformation of spatial-temporal relations take, takes place in ever shorter intervals. The first phase started 10 million years ago, when the first humanoids appeared, appeared on Earth. The second phase comprises the 30,000 years since the Plyde Arc first appeared. This is all Kozelek. Finally, the third phase are the 200 years of modernity. Since 1986, these kinds of long-term summaries of the history of mankind, Jared Di Diamonds, one, once, and, and you name them, have become one of the most popular genres of history generally, although it's rarely practiced by historians, but more often by biologists and geneticists. For Kozelek, as I read him, the decisive element is not the periodization of human history, but rather the temporalization of nature. The temporalization of natural space and time as conditions for human life. And this is emphasized by, emphasized by, his, by his two main uh, empirical examples, water and air. In this process of, uh, of, uh, of space-time compression, he argues, the historical quality of the elements has changed. The historical quality of the elements has changed. It's quite an interesting way to put it, I think. Due to different forms of resource management, water has become more and more territorialized. Whereas in the case of air, it reminds us of the unity of our living space. Even more so, he adds, since it has become the carrier of our contemporary communication system. So this is not yet John Darren Peters' theory of elemental media, but it's nevertheless an interesting take, I think, on the re-entangling of natural and historical times. The whole essay's, uh, essay concludes with a plea for a new form of natural history. And I quote, Recalling the fact that natural pre-givens of our lives may have longer or shorter durations takes us back to the teachings of history writings of old, which used to view nature and the human world as a single entity. But for obvious reasons, the new contemporary version of Historia Naturalis cannot be like the old pre-modern one. A new natural history can only come into being by reassembling, re-entangling natural and historical times based on ideas about multiplicity, coexistence, and scale. And Kozilek's last ever contribution, the almost testamentary, the Rollerschulpune Sprachen Geschichte, Structural Repetitions in Language and History, first published in Seculum in 2006, then in FAZ, represents, I think, a decisive step in this direction. In my opinion, this essay took his thinking to a new level of complexity, mostly in the way it manages to integrate national, uh, natural times. And this is also where I'll finish the lecture. In this text, Kozelek's thinking about nature and natural times makes full circle. That is, it comes back to where it started, to the preface to the 1979 Fragment Zukunft, in a way that fully illustrates the change that his work has gone through in the meantime. And the point to which he returns is the Hadda quote from the Mithic Treatise, which figures so prominently in, the, prominently in that preface, although only in a rather fragmented or even gutted form of <coughs> the Americanism. Uh, when Kozelek makes full circle and returns to this quote almost 30 years later, what he removed from the quote in the 1979 version is put back in. My faults, my step of the flight and my thoughts is no temporal measure for others. Etc. Etc. That is, he doesn't put in there. There's still some dot 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 there. You see, so he doesn't put in the whole the whole quote, but but much of it. So this is here's the entire thing, and the one he leaves out is in red. So he leaves out the elephants and the planets, but he puts in the rivers and the trees for some reason. But I can't explain. 
Just as interesting, however, is the new textual context text, which evokes the change, evokes the change in, and I quote, the temporal status of all the natural sciences investigating the cosmos. Even the natural laws themselves, Gazelic writes, have come to be located on a continuum of their beginning and possible end. And he continues, cosmology, physics, chemistry, biology, and likewise anthropology all need their own theories of time. And then, directly in relation to the Hadda quote, in the meantime, Hadda's metaphysical Kant's formal conception of time as a non-empirical precondition of all experience has expanded its reach to apply to all the sciences. This is now for Gazelle what the Hadda quote illustrates. Not just the plurality of historical times, as in the preface of historical times, as in the preface to Fagam and Zukunft, but the plurality of all times, natural and historical. What follows is no less than a new theoretical grounding for history, both, both human and natural, for the 21st century. The relativity of time with the spectrum of multiple times requires, requires new and unique definitions of the relation between repeatability and singularity for each realm of knowledge and experience, in order to be able to analyze processes that in each case are different from each other, even if they depend on each other. One way in which Kozalek in his late work gives shape to this plurality of times by means of, uh, um, is by means of the geological stratigraphical concept of Zeitschicht and layers, or in the most recent translation, sediments of time. As an example of how theories of time generated within the natural sciences, in this case geology, and theories generated within the disciplines of history can be entangled in a concept, or if you like, even a diagram, this is an important innovation or rather is a revision of conceptualizations developed in the works of Alain Baudet and Christophe Pommian. Partly because this formula has already been widely discussed, and partly because I'm still not convinced that this is Kozalek's most successful way of conceptualizing multiple times, I will leave it here and instead turn my attention to what I consider to be the more, a more promising way of re-entangling natural and historical times that I find in, in, in this, this very same text by means of what is really a concept of rhythm. Another word for a precise and unique pattern of repeatability and singularity is that's because I will have it. Rhythms exist in the continuum, the continuum distributed across different principles uh, of scale from the fast to the slow, accelerating, decelerating, as described in the earlier quote. So, what Kazanek does in the final part of his final essay about structures of repetition is to give us his version of Herder's continuum, continuum of lifetimes, the one you saw here. Or, in his own words, verschieden tief gestaffelten Wiederholungsstrukturen, structures of repetition staggered at various depths. Again, the idea of layers, depth to play in, which has been part of Kazanek's thinking since the beginning of the GG. Not, however, at this point in a specifically geological sense. And in the following, there is no other mention of the idea of layering, which seems to rest on a highly problematic Rodelian correlation between deep down and slow, high up and fast. I think that's not what we're looking for, really. Instead, Kozalek deals with five sets of structures of repetition, five rhythms, if you like, distributed across different life forms, from mineral non life biological life, either animal or human, human collectives, future lives, and finally, life in language, which is, he writes, where all repetitions are or will be acknowledged and brought about. Now, this primacy of language as the only region that cannot be entangled with natural history is confusing and deserves a larger discussion, which I cannot go into here. We might discuss it in the, in the, in the, go into it in the discussions afterwards. What I want to bring attention uh, to your attention, however, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, is how Kazelek like, embeds some of his favorite lifelong topics in a different temporal continuum. Social and political institutions, like work, law, politics, forms of future orientation and predictions, like prophecies, prognosis, and planning, and linguistic functions like syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. These are now understood in continuity with the geological and biological events and processes at specific time scales and life scales. He writes, the more paleontology has extended back into the depths of millions of years, approaching cosmogenesis, 
And the more the microprocessors of biological and physical chemistry come to be implicated all the way to genetic engineering, the more biological, animal, human, natural history come to be intertwined with each other, however much they remain distinguishable. And he goes on to discuss the biological pregivens which humans share with animals. In these final pages of Gazalek's final text, even the much discussed conditions for possible histories, organized in the three banal familiar dichotomies above, below, inside, outside, before, after, are no longer anthropological pregivens. They are biological and as such historical. They are, in Gazalek's own words, determinations of difference that both humans and animals can intensify to radical oppositions. They characterize structures of self-organization and cap capability for actions, structures that continuously repeat themselves by generating singular sequences of events. It sounds like even studying cybernetics at this point, right? In this way, I would suggest, the spell of the Vitruvian man of history, or if you like, the honest face of experience and expectation is definitely broken. And a theoretical platform is established from which a new natural history can be watched. This new natural history might, in a not so distant future, even be able to write the history of mankind as a sixth mass extinction event in a way that would span 540 million years of history, include both asteroids, volcanoes, and indeed man, together with dozens of species going extinct every day. Of course, Kozilek didn't write this history, not even in Nietzsche. And I, to be honest, I don't think he would have either, even if he would have lived to become a hundred. But that's why I think it's all the more important to include this program for a new Historia Naturalis in this already rich legacy alongside space of experience, horizons of expectation, big of Geschichten, and at least a handful of full-fledged theories of historical times. So thank you for your attention.